friends, uh, this is Dr. Rahul, pediatric surgeon, coming to you for another session on pediatric surgery. This time, we're going to have a few insights on uh, the recent updates from the Sebastian 22nd edition. And with regards to pediatric surgery, there is no major change. There are only a very few points uh, which have been added. And uh, most of these points we've already discussed. In fact, all of these have been discussed in our previous discussion topics. At present, I'm going to give you only a few points which have either not been discussed earlier or they've been added as a part of your newer edition. So let's go into it. The only one with regards to recurrent pancreatitis in children. We all know the reason for pancreatitis in children commonly, though viral, gallstones play a part of the role. But there is an entity called as hereditary pancreatitis and pancreas divisum. So there is a short topic on it where it says it is an autosomal dominant disorder with less than 1% of chronic pancreatitis cases. And gene mutations which we need to look into are PRSS1 gene mutation with the trypsin autoactivation. The onset is usually around 5 to 10 years. They are present with recurrent pancreatitis without any clear cause. And you have to suspect only if you have two or more attacks of pancreatitis with a positive family history or absence of any other risk factors. The risk uh, increases. So the other topic is with regards to pancreas divisum. Okay, With regards to pancreas divisum, it is usually due to the failure of duct fusion. There is a dual drainage, as we know, from the duct of Santorini and duct of Wirsang. So MRCP is the diagnostic for pancreas division and ERCP is therapeutic. What do we do? We do a spintroplasty. Most of these cases are fused to if there is a chronic obstruction. So with regards to recurrent pancreatitis, the two things which have been added or we have to have in mind is one with regards to anatomic abnormalities. We already know that pancreas divisum is one uh, close anatomical abnormality in children which can cause recurrent pancreatitis. The other thing which we need to have in mind is with regards to your hereditary pancreatitis where we need to have these gene mutations in mind. Okay. The other point is with regards to a term known as biliary dyskinesia. I think in surgical gastro, we've already dealt with biliary dyskinesia. It is increasing in obese adolescents. The pathophysiology states to dysmotility of the gallbladder leading to biliary colic. The diagnosis is achieved by means of low ejection fraction that is uh, amounted to around less than 35% on CCK stimulation. It has scan. Okay. So there is a short uh, topic with regards to biliary dyskinesia also in children, though not very common, but still also have in mind. So how do you manage it? Cholestectomy if the there is a consistent biliary colic with a low uh, ejection fraction. Otherwise, atypical symptoms warrant a rampant further evaluation before you go in for a cholecystectomy. So there is another short topic with regards to eventration of diaphragm. Yes, we have de uh, detailed uh, about the congenital diaphragmatic hernia, the various types. How do we manage all of them? We all know there are only two types uh, with regards to diaphragmatic lesions. One is an eventration of diaphragm and a diaphragmatic hernia. In diaphragmatic hernia, there is no musculature. There is a defect in the diaphragm, whereas in eventration, there is a thinned out a diaphragm. There is a thinned out diaphragm, hence there is elevation of one hemidiaphragm and this can be on the right or on the left. This can be congenital or acute. What are the common causes uh, congenitally which can occur all these lesions? When a, when a child is born, iatrogenically you can have a phrenic nerve injury uh, which can be a component of nerves palsy or a cardiac surgical trauma. Diagnosis is by means of a dynamic ultrasound where you clearly make out if the child has a possible of an eventration. Pleuroscopy is again a very good diagnostic uh, modality where there is absent or paradoxical motion of the diaphragm. So initially whenever you suspect an eventration diaphragm, initially you take an x-ray and x-ray you will know that there is an abnormal elevation on one side of the hemidiaphragm. This may be on the right or the left. Then go evaluate the cause. It can be congenital acute. It can be because of any uh, lesions uh, post-traumatic it can be because of phrenic nerve injuries. It can be because of herbs palsy. This can be uh, an obstetric injury where a child can have eventration post-obstetric trauma as well. To diagnose it initially by means of an X-ray, high index of suspicion, do dynamic ultrasound fluoroscopy. There is absent or paradoxical motion of the ipsilateral diaphragm. How do you repair it? There are two uh, entities where we can do. You can one, you can do a uh, plication. This plication can be done by open repair or by a thoracoscopic repair by means of non-absorbable sutures. Or there is another mode of managing such as excisional tapering where you. Ex 
exercise within the diaphragm and then do a tapering. And finally, you achieve a taut diaphragm. Your aim is to achieve a taut diaphragm so that there is no paradoxical motion. These uh, children may present you with uh, recurrent respiratory distress and uh, some children will have so high respiratory distress or recurrent episodes of pneumonia, they go into ventilator. You can uh, classically see uh, an eventration and uh, post ventilation, they are not able to be weaned on the ventilator. So any child who has a failure to wean from ventilators with an established eventration, go ahead with repair or the child has a recurrent respiratory distress, recurrent pneumonia, you go ahead with a surgical repair, which can be an open or a laparoscopic diaphragmatic plication using non-observable sutures or you can have an excisional tapering as a part of your surgical procedure. It's just an x-ray to show you a huge elevation of your right hemidiaphragm showing a right eventration of the diaphragm. Okay. So next, uh, there are points which you need to know about esophageal atresia. We have discussed a lot about the prognosticative indications of congenital diaphragmatic hernia in a previous discussions. With regards to esophageal atresia, the prognosticative factor uh, mandates towards a spitz classification. This is mainly uh, based on two modalities. One is birth weight. Second one is cardiac anomalies. Presence or absence of cardiac anomaly. So, whenever you have a child which is more than 1.5 kgs, no cardiac anomaly, they say it's around 97% of survival. Uh, less than or equal to 1.5 kgs or a major cardiac anomaly around 59% survival. Uh, when it's less than uh, 1.5 kgs, along with the cardiac anomaly, it has a very uh, less amount of survival, according to around 22% of survival. And uh, regards to post-operative issues, we've already discussed about GER, stricture, leak, and tracheomalacia. And we all know that these are the various components which can occur after a part of esophageal atresia. But remember, the added point, which we have not discussed in a previous discussion with regards to spritz classification, this is prognostication esophageal atresia based on two important components. One is birth weight. Second one is cardiac anomaly. Please. Okay. And finally, with regards to congenital diaphragmatic hernia, we have all discussed in detail about the embryology of uh, the development of diaphragm and how does diaphragmatic hernia occurs, how does the left occur, and which is most common, and how does the right occur, what are the names, and what are the prognosticative factors, and what do you look in a newborn with regards to congenital diaphragmatic hernia, and what are the post-ventilation long-term side effects. All of these have been uh, uh, consolidated and put together in congenital diaphragmatic hernia uh, discussion in the previous topics with regards to further points the, with regard, the modern management is as already we had discussed diaphragmatic hernia is not a surgical emergency it is a medical emergency we stabilize the child of pulmonary hypertension this pulmonary artery hypertension is going to be the major cause of mor morbidity and mortality in these children hence pulmonary hypertension has to be uh, stabilized by airway stabilization gentle ventilation and a permissive hypercapnia all of these put together will be the initial management and uh, high volume centers always try to improve outcomes by means of treating the pulmonary hypertension by various adjuvant methods such as nitric oxide, high frequency oscillatory ventilation and ECMO supports, uh, prostaglandins, sildenafil. All of these have been various adjuncts which have been used. We have already discussed in our previous topics with regards to our ECMO, the uses and what is its role in case of uh, congenital diaphragmatic hernia having, having severe pulmonary hypertension, severe uh, lung hypoplasias. But the one thing which we need uh, to know which is added in the latest edition with regards to the fetal therapy. We all know the fetal therapy with regards to congenital diaphragmatic hernia or tracheoesophageal fistula has been a fetotherapy or a fetal tracheal occlusion therapy is one fetal therapy which we uh, have as a part of congenital diaphragmatic hernia or tracheoesophageal fistula to re uh, I mean, uh, improve the lung of the hypoplastic condition because this hypoplasia is going to be the major cause of morbidity and mortality in these children. They, we have something that's a fetal tracheal occlusion therapy and now they just added a trial onto it known as a total trial whereas a tracheal occlusion improves lung growth and early survival trial which is again having a major impact saying that fetal tracheal occlusion therapy may or in fact improves in a lot of cases your pulmonary uh, complaints and therefore improves your morbidity and mortality in children with a congenital diaphragmatic hernia. So with regards to fetal therapy, remember the term total trial alone. So these are only the very, very few points which they've added in Sebastian. So I've not gone into detail because all of the other points have been discussed in each of the corresponding topics uh, with regards to uh, pediatric surgical subspecialties. And uh, there is nothing much you need to go in and read in Sebastian. And these are the only few points which, can which you can take into consideration will be uh, of great uh, use to you.
So thank you, dear friends, for your patient listening and uh, just waiting to meet in another session of uh, pediatric surgical uh, subspecialties or major pediatric surgical topics to share and make sure we both enjoy the speciality. Thank you, dear friends.